Okay? Right? So um, we'll take a look at that, okay? Well, let's pray together before we start. Our Father, we pray that we will be challenged to know the Scriptures in a little bit more detail, to be clearer, to be meticulous, to look at every detail and to examine. Most of all, help us to be diligent in the way we would study your word, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That We pray that you would teach us what it means to be chosen to fulfill your will. We pray that you would enlighten us tonight from, as we read the scriptures. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, let's take a look at 1 Samuel. At this, we're going to take a look at how Saul became the first king of Israel. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9. Now, okay. Now, we read, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish. And then the son of Abiel, the son of Zebo, the son of Bekorah, the son of Apia, a Benjamite. Okay? Now, we're told he was a mighty man of power. So Saul's father was a pretty famous already. We're told, this is from the tribe of Benjamin, we're told that his father was a mighty man of power, and then uh, he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. So these were some of the features that were observed, right? Uh, written there. And in fact, he was, uh, there was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. In other words, he was very handsome, okay? to, to say the least. Okay? So there we have uh, you know, it put there. Now, then we are told he was tall. In fact, his shoulder, he, from his shoulder upward, he was taller than any of the people. So he was tall, handsome, short of saying he was dark. Tall, dark and handsome. But dark is not mentioned here. So he was very handsome and tall. Right? So, you know what? Hey, this looks good. Now, then uh, the story goes... There was you know, donkeys that were lost. Uh, father sends him out, and he went out. Okay? Now, we know the story of Saul. We must know that he had, was given everything possible to succeed. What does it take to succeed? I know we know the story that he did not go very far as the first king. Right After the second year, things turned bad. Okay? But we must note this. He was not given the short end of the stick. He was literally given every opportunity to do well, to succeed. Okay? So, um, success. Now, what was the thing that he was... Getting? Now, all the other things like handsome and tall... This is, this is just observation. It's just to tell you, uh, these are their features that are there. Okay? Uh, he did not succeed because he was tall and handsome. In fact, you need to be more than that. Right? Now, what are some of the things? Was he chosen? Yes. Did God choose him? Okay? Now, we read this. He, he was chosen by God, 1 Samuel 9.17. Okay, uh, we read uh, 9 verse 17, we read that God pointed it out to Samuel. When Samuel saw uh, uh, Saul and the Lord said, There he is, the man whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Right? Okay, and then we read chapter 10 
verse 24, and Samuel will introduce uh, Saul as the one whom God has chosen. Okay, that's 10.24, right? Now, he was anointed, chapter 10, verse 1. So Samuel would take the flask of oil, pour on the head and say, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Now, there we go. Anointed by God to be the commander. Chosen by God. Right? He was also given the Spirit of God. Verse 10, chapter 10. Okay? Uh, verse 6, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. Verse 10, uh, we read, okay, they came there, a group of prophets would meet, were to meet with him. The Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. And then uh, it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he prophesied among the prophets, they said to one another, uh, what is this? has come upon the son of Kish. Now, so it was pretty obvious, right? He became, he was able to uh, bring the Lord's word. There were insights there, as it were, like a prophet. So much so that people who knew him, wow, is this the same person? So it was very, very obvious and distinctive. Okay? that the Spirit of God was upon him. We read. Okay? Right? So, verse 6, the Spirit of God will come upon him, he will be turned into another man. And then, what does that mean? It means, look at the changes that can come when the Spirit of God is really upon the person. And it can be a very, very obvious thing. You can tell this person, the Spirit of God is upon. One, the Word of the Lord will come alive. Like the prophets, they were able to uh, bring the Word of God. Okay? Now, this is interesting. This was given by God. Right? Now, what else did he have? He had Samuel, chapter 10, all the way to chapter 12. Samuel would guide him, would teach him. He had the Spirit of God. He had Samuel as a spiritual guide to teach him concerning the behaviors of kings, concerning uh, what is God required of him, right? Now, we note there were significant opportunities uh, to be established as king. So, all these things, this is covered in chapter 10 all the way to chapter 12. Right? So, these things were given. Everything he needs to succeed. What is needed? One of the most important things is the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God upon you, you will not be able to succeed. Right? To fulfill the will of God, you need the Spirit of God to enlighten, you need the Spirit of God to empower, to enable, and more. You can't do this in your own spirit, in other words. Right? Now, we have Samuel doing his part, okay? And he ministered faithfully. You see, there will be the king. What does it take to succeed for the whole nation. You need the leader to be there, the king, and you need the people, not just the king. Right? We can often say, well, the leaders, the leaders, the leaders. Now, look what Samuel, Samuel spoke to the people and he said to them, right? In chapter 12, uh, he addressed the people. Okay, he said to all Israel, Indeed, I've hid it, heeded your voice in all that you said to me and have made a king over you. You wanted this. Right? You, did, you have rejected God to reign over you. You wanted a king. 
just like everybody else. Now, God says, consent to this. And so he tells them, I have, now this is your king. He will walk before you. Okay, I'm old, gray-headed. My sons are with you. I have uh, walked before you from my childhood to this day. Okay, and then he says, witness against me before the Lord, before his anointed. Okay, whose ox I have I taken, or whose donkey have I taken, or whom I have cheated? Whom have I oppressed, from whose hand I have received bribe, which to blind my eyes, I will restore it to you. And they said, you have not cheated us, nor oppressed us, nor have taken anything else. In other words, Samuel has been faithful. Right? Let, let's be very, very clear. You know what? He is going to bring this out. And then they said, look, uh, you know, there's, they, he cannot fault them. And then he said to them, the Lord is witness against you. His anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. And then he said to the people, right? He tells them, it is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you uh, before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which uh, you know, did to you. Okay? Then he mentioned Jacob, and then he uh, talks about how that God heard their cry, sent Moses and Aaron. See, this is what, what Samuel, how Samuel taught. He reviewed history. And from history, there were vital lessons that were meant to be learned. That's what we're doing. We go look at the history. What are we looking? Not just Moses. What was it that is need to be? There were vital lessons that needed to be learned, and he would repeat them. Because if you don't learn them well, you're going to repeat history. And so he tells them, "Look, look at this here, okay?" And um, he cried out to God. Uh, Verse 9, when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army, of the, you know, the hand of the Philistines. Okay? So the enemies that were there. So every time they forget God, they disobey God, they sin against God, the enemies would have an upper hand. Now this is kind of repeated throughout the entire book of Judges. Right? And so uh, we read, then they were crying out to God, and then they said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord. We've served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Now deliver us. And the Lord would send judges. Right? Jeroboam, Baden, Japheth, and Samuel, meaning he was the last judge. Okay? And so delivered you out, and then they could dwell safely. Now, when you saw Nahash, king of the Amorites, uh, came against you, you said to be no, but a king shall reign over us. The Lord was your king. Now therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen, you desired. Take note, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord, serve him, obey his voice, do not rebel against his command, the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord. So not just the king, you, the people, okay? You fear the Lord, you obey the Lord, right? And then if you do these things, you don't rebel against Him, then they, you will continue to reign. But however, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of God will be against you as it was against your fathers. Right? So this is important. When, yes, we look at the king, uh, we look at him, we look at how he would lead, and so on and so forth, but the people, 
are responsible for walking with the Lord. See, today we have this problem. Yeah? You, you, all the time, you blame the leaders. Say, he's not doing his job, he should do this, he should do that, he should do the other thing, he should do this. It is so easy to blame. Sure, they are, they are faults, they, they have done wrong for some, but what about the people? Are we blameless? When there is a problem, it's not just king, it's people. So the whole lot, now we are to see this as Samuel spoke with them, you and your king. Now, take a look at the last part of it. Okay, Verse 25, if you do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Right? So this is important to uh, look at. But they refused to listen to Samuel. They insisted that they wanted the king. Okay, so Samuel says to them, I will pray for you. I will teach you in the right way. Right? Verse 23, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against God in ceasing to pray for you. That means I will continue to do my part, but I will teach you the good and right way. So this is important. Yes, we talk about praying. But prayer must be matched with teaching. This is the good and right way. Right? Teaching about the Lord, about His ways, that which is good, that which is right. Because if we just pray and you don't have the Lord's Word, you can pray amiss. You can pray wrongly. And that's very possible. Right? So the both is needed. I will pray for you. And you mustn't think, okay, uh, Samuel's praying for us. We're all right. Okay, just please pray for us. And right, a lot of the time people ask, Pastor, please pray. Please pray for us. Please pray for me. Please pray for my family. Please pray for... Yes, but you must learn the good and right way. Because can pray for you, but if you don't walk in the good and right way of the Lord, how is it going to work out? It's not going to work out, very obviously. Right? So, these things are there. Remember, you can be the son, and if you don't, it's not going to work out too. Okay? So, when God chooses and man chooses, not quite the same. Right? Samuel can say, well, let, let's choose. I chose my sons. Didn't come from God. Sure, he may go to Jesse's house later. He chose the eldest boy. God says, nope. We need to learn how does God choose? What does God look for? Now, these are important things that we must really consider. Okay? Now, we have a look at Saul in given everything, remember this, to succeed. To find faith, to be that leader. Saul, Samuel taught him, walk in the good and right way, and you will reign. You will be established. You and the people. I mean, before the people, before him. So you cannot say, I didn't know. Now, we see... Uh, okay, so look at all these things. This is all done. Now, there was significant setbacks. Okay, we begin to see the problems that were there under the reign of Saul. Okay, you begin to see problems already surfacing. Okay, now look at, take a look at chapter 11. One of the problems is the way how, remember, Saul, Samuel would tell the people, you want a king, right? He says, yes, we want a king. The king will fight for us. The king will lead us into battle. And then Samuel tells them, this is what the king, the king will take from you. He will take your daughters. He will take your sons. He will take the best. He will take. But they won't listen. They'll say, we want a king anyway. And so 
uh, that it was given. Now, let's take a look at what happened under the reign of uh, King Saul. Right? Now, in 1 Samuel 11 verse 8, we see the army of Israel okay, here. When he first started, okay, when he first took over, uh, he numbered them, and the children of Israel was 300,000. The men of Judah was 30,000. So you put them together, you would at least have 330,000. An army off. Right? Then they were there. 330,000. Now, take a look at verse uh, chapter 13 now. So he was coronated okay, to be king. And then chapter 13, just the first part, Saul reigned one year. And then we read, uh, when he had reigned uh, two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul, uh, right? And then we read uh, 1,000 with his son Jonathan. And then the rest he sent away. So we see a reduction in the army size from 330,000 to 3,000 only in two years. He reduced the army to 3,000. What? For whatever reason. He won the first battle. Now he maybe think, okay, now we're, we're pretty safe. So he made a decision to reduce the army. Maybe, they, it, I mean, any army is costly, isn't it? It's costly to, to have army, to run, you've got to provide, and, and so on and so forth. So he made the decision, 2,000 will be with me, 1,000 will be with Jonathan, Right Now, we have a problem. The Philistines came, and they gathered to fight with Israel. He did not anticipate a war so soon. In verse 5, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen came. <laughs> now, you've got 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen. 3,000 versus this. They are outnumbered, obviously. Right? And so we were told uh, the Hebrews were there and they scattered. Okay, the people scattered. Saul uh, was there. They were distressed. Now, when verse 6, with the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, the people were in distress. The people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks. And they were uh, finding whatever hole they could find and hide. I mean, that is pretty sad. Right? And so, uh, here in the panic, Saul was at Gilgah. He was, the people who followed him were trembling. They waited seven days. Samuel has not arrived. And then he uh, made an offering a peace offering, and he offered burnt offering. And it happened as soon as he finished, uh, Samuel came, Saul went to meet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And then he said, look, I saw the people, they were scattered, and they did not, uh, you didn't come, and the Philistines are gathered. And then he said, uh, you know, the Philistines will come down now on me at Gilgah, and I have not made supplication to the Lord, therefore I felt compelled, I offered. Right? Now, it is the role of the priest or the role of that special anointed servant of God. It's certainly not the role of the king. And so he took upon himself something he knew he shouldn't do. But because it was a panic, because you didn't show up, I better do this. So God will be there to protect us. See, prayer is not a, okay, like a charm. 
right? So, see, this will tell you a little bit about what Saul is like. He's not a very spiritual man at all. So here, this is the offering. He sees it as, okay, I better offer, then God will protect us. It doesn't work like that. Right? Foolishly, he did that. So Samuel said, you have done foolishly. So, you've done foolishly. You have not kept the commandments of the Lord your God, which He commanded. For now the Lord would have established the king, your kingdom over Israel. But now your kingdom will not continue. There is a reason why God does not establish certain people. Why does He hold back? So, this, this is the reason for Saul. By now, you should have been established, but you're not. Why? You, you have not kept the commandment of the Lord. You've done foolishly. Right? He did not seek the Lord, counsel. He, did not, he just did things as he wished. One, he go and reduce the army. That's a very silly thing to do. That's a very foolish thing to do when you are surrounded by enemies. Right? You presume, now we'll be all right. Now you're in trouble. And problem after problem. We see him making foolish decisions one after another. This is foolish act one after another. Right? So you have all available to you all the resources, but you don't use it. There's Samuel, you don't learn from him. If you're not, he's not learned well. There's the Spirit of God to guide, but you are not led by the Spirit of God. You're not going to yield to the Spirit's leading. There are the Scriptures, you don't read it. So there's, there's your soul. He has every reason to succeed, but here, he's gone on his own. Right now, he goes on to do something that will lead to God's rejecting him. Okay, and then chapter fifty, he makes a you know he makes a rash oath, and that endangered his endangered his men even more. That's him. He makes rash oath. Okay, so he makes an oath. For example, like chapter fourteen, verse twenty-four, and he will said. Uh, you know, the men of Israel were distressed that day. Saul placed them under oath, saying, Curse is the man who eats any food until evening before I have vengeance on my enemies. Come on. They are a bit overconfident, isn't it? Your, the army is already weakened. And you make such an oath. He says, I will basically defeat them by the end of the day. And of course, they almost died. Okay, so lots and lots of problems we are seeing over here. Okay, they didn't even have weapons. It was so bad that the Philistines said, you cannot have any blacksmith. You can only have you know, farming tools. They had a small army. They were scattered they now have no weapons. The only way to sharpen their tools is to go to, the, go to the Philistines, right? And then they must pay just to sharpen an axe. So that's where they were, under Saul's reign, which is a really, really sad situation uh, over here. Very, very sad state of affair. Right? You read this in chapter 13. Okay, so let's go that. Foolish decisions, and now, what, what makes it worse? He disobeys God. Okay? And in chapter 15, Samuel said to Saul, The Lord has sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now heed the word of the Lord. And so, here is another opportunity given. God is going to send him on a mission to punish um, Amalek for what he did to Israel, right? So this is to execute the judgment of God upon Amalek 
and uh, the, the people there, they were to go attack, utterly destroy all that they have. He is not to spare them, kill both man, woman, infant, nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, donkey, or that is a pretty sobering word. Right? You see, how come uh, these things are... Saul gathered the people and they numbered, he numbered them. 200, uh, you know, there they were. 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men came to the city. Okay? So he panicked and he basically raised an army now. He sent them all away. <laughs> he brings them back. Okay, now we need to uh, do this. Okay, now then Saul said to the Canaanites, Go down, attack the Amalekites. I, I destroy you with them. Okay, and then, um, for you've showed kindness to Israel. Right? So he was sent out. Now, Saul, we read, okay, he took King Agag of the Amalekites. Malachites alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people sped Agag, the best of the sheep, the oxen, uh, the fatlings, the lambs, that was good. They were unwilling to utterly destroy. So there was a clear word given and he was unwilling. Everything despised, worthless, they destroyed. And so we read, the word of the Lord came to Samuel and said, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. And he has turned back from following me. He has not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel. And he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose in the morning to meet with Saul, and he told, uh, you know, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. Goodness. I mean, seriously. First, he, he mean he think he had the victory, and he really convinced he did everything right, and he builds a monument for himself, right? And then he has gone around, passed by, gone down to Gilgal. Samuel went to Saul. Saul said to him, "Blessed are you of the Lord." Look at him; he can say all the nice words, all the right words. And then he says, "I have performed the commandments of the Lord." And then Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears, uh, right? The lowing of the oxen which I hear. And then Saul said, Oh, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared them. The best of the sheep, you see, the people spared them. <laughs> right? And then the oxen, to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Okay? And then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And then he said to him, Okay, speak on. Samuel, so Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribe? And did, you, and did not the Lord anoint you as king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you stoop down to the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And then Samuel said, Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed. This is really, right? you're confronted and you deny wrong. I have obeyed. No, you have not obeyed, but I have obeyed, he says. And then he says, look, I've gone on the mission which the Lord sent me. I have brought back Agag, king of uh, Amalek. I have utterly destroyed them. But the people took the plunder, the sheep, the oxen, the best things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God. See, I did my part. That I've done my part, but the people, the people. So he shifts blame to people. Right? Well, uh, this doesn't really help at all. Samuel said, 
these words to him. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You see, what is more important? What does God really delight in? That's a good question. See, as we come for worship, as we give offering and we offer sacrifices and all that, what do you think God is looking for? And, and so he says, what do you think God delights in? Is, oh, as, look at this, as obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To heed his word is better than the fat of the lambs. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. See, he does not understand the severity of his sins. Obviously. It's pretty clear he doesn't understand the severity of his sins. Right? Well, you know, I, I did. I mean, generally I obeyed. I kept it, I went out like he said, I destroyed as he said, but I brought back these things. You know, they're good. In his mind, he's reasoning. You know, I'm, I'm bringing back the good stuff for God. I'm bringing the offerings for God. You can reason whatever left, right, center you wish. It is still, you have not obeyed. Right? Look at this. Rebellion is the same Sin as witchcraft. It's a serious sin, the sin of witchcraft, which is abhorred by God, which in those days punishable by death. And this is compared, rebellion is as the sin. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. What is the Ten Commandments? You shall not worship other gods. Right? That one is punishable by death. You know what is the same sin as idolatry? Put here, stubbornness. When you are confronted, but you will stubbornly, you would not admit wrong, you would justify yourself, and you resist, you, you make it worse for yourself. One, we have rebellion. Two, we have stubbornness here. And then three, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, God rejects you from being king. Now, is that possible? That God can reject a person He has chosen, He has anointed and given the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. And His reasons are very clear. Right? You are stubborn, you are rebellious and you have rejected the word of God. He sees he is right. God sends Samuel to tell him, this is what you have done. Now, let's take a look at his response. And Samuel said, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now here is, okay, yeah, actually, now he admits. But, you know why? Because I feared the people. Because the people wanted it that way. Right? It's, okay, I, I will confess, please forgive me, but... If you are really asking for forgiveness, there is no but. There would be a plea for mercy. Look at this, alright? So, you can try to say all the right words. And he is, okay, you, you, you okay, I, I can't get out of this. Alright, uh, I have sinned. Say the right words, I have sinned. Okay, and then he says, look, but now therefore, please pardon my sin. Return with me that I may worship God. He still does not understand the severity of his sins. Which part of God has rejected you do you not understand? 
Does he fear the Lord? No. Does he really fear the Lord? No. If you do, you wouldn't dare to ask. Okay, forgive me now so I could carry on with worship. Right? And so Samuel says to him, I, I'm not going to return with you. I will not return with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has... So this is literally reiterating it to him. You, do you not hear me? You rejected the word of God. God has rejected you from being king. And he says, okay, pardon me now so I can go back on being king. No, you, you don't understand. You, do you? You have rejected the word of God. God has rejected you from being king. Now, and then he turns around. Samuel turns to go away. Saul seized the edge of his robe and tore it. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. The strength of Israel will not lie nor relent. He, meaning God, is not a man that he would relent. You cannot get out of this. And he said, look, I have sinned. I've already said it, all right? You, you need me to say, confess my sin. I will confess my sin. I have sinned. Yet, honor me now. Please, before the elders of my people, before Israel, return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul. Saul worshipped the Lord. Is that what you want? You know what he wants? So I don't look bad on in front of all the people. If you don't come with me, and if I go alone, it's going to look bad. It's really going to look bad before the leaders, before the people. So Samuel reluctantly, okay, let's walk. I'll walk with you. But from then onwards, Samuel never met up with Saul. See, what does it mean when God rejects? And it's painful. We don't realize that this can happen. The reasons are very clearly given. If, you, if he has rejected the word of God, not once, not twice, but again and again. Has he really confessed his sin? No. He is not spiritual. He is not a man of faith. He is not a person who fears God. He cannot continue. And so God rejected him to be king. Now, look at the consequences. One, Samuel will, will depart from Saul. Right? Remember? God gave Samuel to him to teach, to guide. He has not learnt. And so now Samuel is going to be taken away. Verse 35, we read this. Okay? Samuel mourned and then regretted that he had made now. The Lord regret now. No more that he is going to be there. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Chapter 16, verse 14, we read, the Spirit of God departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now that is another painful thing. God's Spirit will now depart from him. It will no longer be upon him. In place, a distressing spirit comes upon him. Right? What do you have? If you reject God, you see, to reject His Word is to reject Him. If God is rejected, what have you got? And rather than God establish Him, He, he seeks to establish Himself. And that's very, very painful. Now God chooses someone else. Chapter 16, we read, how Samuel would be sent to the house of Jesse, right? And says, God says, I have provided for myself a king among uh, the sons of Jesse, his sons. And then Samuel was afraid because he was afraid that Saul would kill him, but he would go, right? Now, 
he was asked to uh, look for the right things. Now, take a look at verse 7. So God said to Samuel, do not look at appearances, his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. Now, son after son was brought to before Samuel, and we need to know what God looks for. God does not see as man sees. God is not going to be uh, overly concerned about physical appearances. What does God look for? And God says, right? Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And this is what we are going to look at at the church family camp. What was David's heart like? Right? You see, on the outward, you see Saul. He does all the right things, says all the right things. But his heart was rebellious. His heart was stubborn. His heart... See, he blames others rather than admit, rather than confess genuinely. He would blame others. Now, there is your problem. There's a very different person, heart that, that is there. Right? We're going to take a look at what David will be, what David's heart like. So I put down there three psalms, right? The heart of David in time to come, just to give us a glimpse. One, David had a heart that loved God. Now, it doesn't mean he was a perfect person, he didn't sin. He, there, there were times he made foolish decisions. There were times he sinned against God. He was chastised badly. But you know what? He would love the Lord even more because of the mercy of God extended to him. Psalm 18 reflected that. He will say, I will love the Lord. My God, you know, this is my, he's my strength, my fortress, my rock. Right? What does God look for? God looks at the heart. So we must investigate. What was his heart like? He had a love for God. Two, he had a love for the Word of God. This is Psalm 19, obviously. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Right? He sees the Word of God as perfect, as pure, as right. There is a love for the Word of God. See, you can read the Word of God, but you don't love it. You can read it because, you know what, I want to find out information. You can read it and say, look, because I, I you know, there's so much I can learn. Great. But love is not quite the same. For David, it was love. More to be desired are they than go. Sweeter also than the honey and the honey comb. Nothing matches the Word of God. Now, you don't just say it. He, he never really said, I love God's Word. He never said that. But if you read his Psalms carefully, you would say, this person really loved the Word of God. The book of Psalms, 50% of the book of Psalms, 50% of the Psalms were written by him. He took the time to meditate on the Word of God. He didn't just read it, but he would dwell, he would ponder the Word of God. He would inspire him. Of course, it, he, he, how did he find the time to, to do all those things? And you would see, okay, yeah, the Word of God was something that was precious to David. Okay, well, let's just take a look at this. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel 23. Okay, now these are, this is like his reflection. This is Samuel in his evening years as he looks back in life, Right? This is beyond David and Goliath battles and all that. This is as he looks back and he says, okay, chapter 23, 2 Samuel, 
These are the words, last words of David. And he says, Thus says David, the son of Jesse. Thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. That's what he was called. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He, would, he who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be like the light of the morning. And when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after the rain. See, the word God would speak to him through his word. Not only, they were not just words that he write for others, they were words written for him. The Spirit of God spoke by me. Now, this was important. Right? And so he says, although my house is not so with God, Yet he made with, with me an everlasting covenant. And that was a very special thing that God did for him. Right? Well, we will be looking at how his love for the Lord's house was something that was really, really special. At the church family camp um, next, next week, we were going to be learning in the evening. Right? Love for God, a love for His Word, a love for the house of God. Okay? These were the things. This was His heart. So when God says He looks at the heart, what does He see? Well, this is what we are going to look for. Right? God says, I look at the heart. This is why we are going to study the life of David a little bit. He looks for that heart of love for him. How do you know a person truly loved his, love him? They will take heed to his word. They will love his word. How do you know the person loved, loved the Lord? They will love his house as well. They are all expressions of, Right? So this is, um, you know, we conclude a Bible study, the special series. This has always been planned this way, to bring it up so we can you know, look forward to the Bible study with, with these historical backgrounds. David was not the first king chosen. There was someone else, Saul. Right? So when we look at the whole idea of God choosing, right, the will of God he chooses, He anoints. There is a part that we must fulfill. This heart has got to be cultivated. Right? So it's not, if God chooses, God anoints, therefore, you know, it will be alright. No matter what the person does. That's not true. Saul will be that example. That's not true. Right? We've got to cultivate God has done His part and more. He gives to us His Word. He sends servants to teach. We've got to learn. Right? He gives us the opportunity. He gives us His Spirit. Lots and lots of things are given to us, actually. It's a question of what we do with them. We were meant to cultivate a heart of love deeply for the Lord, for His Word, for His house. And so this was said, God looks at the heart. And this will become something that would guide readers what to look for, for the rest. What was David's heart like? What was he really like? Right? Now, how he began how he continued. Now, did he all the way did well? No. There were, there were moments of weakness. There were moments of folly. But he had a heart of love and he would always come back to the Lord. Right? 
it is something to think about. Right, any questions you want to raise up on, on this matter here, on, on the study here? Okay, so um, we could not take up every single chapter, every single phrase. Uh, the, the challenge was to have a general feel for these historical books, right? And, and to learn the vital lessons that are there presented to us. And um, these things are still relevant today. They are consequences of rejection. Rejecting His Word, rejecting God, would there be consequences? Yes. And Saul suffered those consequences for the rest of his reign. How did he end? He ended up killing himself. That was a very, very sad thing. Right? He would seek God, and God would not answer him anymore. He would seek the counsel of God. God, no response. And then, you know what? He would just do his own thing. Painfully. Right? So, this is where the Scriptures want to seek the Lord when He may be found. Seek Him earnestly. What is the Lord's word to us today? What is it that He wants us to do? Right? Chosen. We talk about being chosen. We talk about how the Lord has done His part in giving to us everything we need, His Spirit and more. But what is His what is the thing that He has called us to do too? That's our challenge today. Now God looks at the heart. Now that's what we read. He looks at the heart. God does not see as man sees. God examines the heart. And we must examine our heart. Right? What is our heart like? Now this is something I do for myself. I examine my own heart. I recognize I need the Spirit of God. If the Spirit of God departs from me, I, I will be in serious trouble. There will be no word. There will be no... You can study the Scriptures. You can try your utmost. Nothing will come out of it. The Spirit of God is perhaps the most vital gift to have, and yet He did not treasure it. Painfully. Okay, so we must not take things for granted. Now, let's not take our faith for granted. Let's not take the Spirit of God for granted. Let's not take the many things that we are actually given for granted. Okay? Right, any questions you want to raise up on, on this matter here? Okay? So the challenging things, you know, well, he was given a mission and they were meant to be there and yet he would make all kinds of excuses. Right? So this is what we can do. Do a comparative study. Profile, so, and then take a look at David. Do your own comparative work. Okay? Well, these are, these are lessons that we must learn. That, look, that's how Samuel taught. He brought up Moses. He brought up all the different things. Same thing today. God has been same. These were the things that were meant to be learned. If they're not learned well, history can repeat itself. Right? And so we must greatly challenge to see, look, how do we learn all these things today for ourselves? Right? Can one person make all the difference? One David made a big difference. He would be the one who would actually organize the priesthood. He would organize the worship. He brought the people back to worship God. He was not just a political leader. He brought the people back to God through his own life, through his faith, through his love for God, and, and, and that was it. Right? So this is something that, you know, can, can, we be, can we make a difference? Can we be a person that really will make a 
difference wherever we are, whether in our family, in our community, wherever it is. It takes one. God is the one who chooses. He anoints. He gives His Holy Spirit. He will supply, but we got to do our part. We've got to do our part. All right? Very clear. You know, if you would obey, if you would follow, if you would keep these things, then it will continue. You will continue following the Lord. All right? Okay, well, may, may our hearts be challenged by um, what we are looking at tonight, and may the Lord really bless each one of us as we go from here. I just want to say thank you for uh, you know, giving up your time and coming for these Bible studies. It's been a real delight to read the, the Old Testament again, to study it, and to really seek the Lord for, for that word for all of us. Uh, may the Lord bless as we uh, you know, learn. That. Let's love the Lord's word. Let's develop a deeper love for His Word. Okay? May we have such a heart. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for the Scriptures. We thank You for faithful servants like Samuel, who taught, who ministered, who prayed, giving us an example of the difference He can make in the life of David. Perhaps even he was there and Saul took it for granted. But help us not to lose hope when things are taken for granted, but to hope that from among us will rise one like David who loves you deeply, who loves your word and your house. And we pray that you would encourage our hearts as we go from here to cultivate such a heart too. Help us to never take for granted all that we have been truly blessed with. We have been blessed with your word. We have been blessed with people who teach your word. We have been blessed with your Holy Spirit given to us. May we cherish these blessings deeply. And may we be able to develop our life, our ministry, even more, taking heed to all these things. We ask that you would bless us as we go from here. Help us to look forward to the church family camp, that we may learn how we can cultivate such a heart of love for you, for your word, and for your house. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.